In our previous videos on MRP, we have learned all of the various inputs that are needed to make an MRP system run smoothly, including the inputs like the master production schedule, the bill of materials, the um, inventory records, and everything that's needed to make uh, the MPS and the MRP run smoothly. We then did a couple uh, MRP processing where we did lot for lot and lot sizes uh, to help determine the net requirements plans that we needed. Well, now let's just talk about some of the, the final things in regards to MRP, which is the outputs, um, some of the reports that you will see, uh, and some of the other things that we can use um, in addition to MRP, like capacity resource planning and ERP systems. So when we run MRP, when we explode uh, the bill of materials, the bomb, and uh, look at the requirements that are out there, there's different ways to run MRP. The first kind of MRP system uh, that we can uh, have is a regenerative system. This is, this, this is the approach that updates MRP records periodically. Um, this is best suited for very, fairly stable systems and requires data accuracy of 90% or better. Now, I would make the argument that any kind of MRP system, you want data accuracy as close to 100% as possible. Whether it's a regenerative system or a net change system is irrelevant to me. I want data accuracy that's close to 100% as possible because any inaccuracy in data when you run MRP means you're either going to have a shortage or you're going to have excess inventory or something's not going to be coming in on the day that you need. So you want data accuracy as close to 100% as possible. But a regenerative system, what that means is um, at one of the facilities that I worked, uh, it was a regenerative system. Another facility was a net change system. So the regenerative system, what that means is I would run MRP once a week. Every Friday night after people had left the facility, I would uh, load the master production schedule. I would check some of our key inventory items, and then I would run MRP. It would explode the bomb, do the MRP processing, and it would tell us what our net requirements were. That's a regenerative system. MRP was processed when I chose to do it, and I chose Friday night because if something went wrong, I could come in on the weekend and fix it when there weren't that many employees there. A net change system is an approach that updates MRP records continuously. So what that means is it's probably going to run either MRP every single night or it's going to be running it real time. Uh, it can be either one. Uh, I've worked in a net change system before as well. And what you find is when you come into work every day, you've got a big stack of MRP papers telling you, here's what you need to buy, when it needs to come in, and how many. Uh, it also will give you exception reports. Uh, maybe you need to push out an order or push in an order or reduce an order or something along those lines. Those are exception reports. And every time MRP runs and is processed, uh, it will give you a new um, batch of MRP outputs, various different reports that are done after MRP is processed. So a regenerative system is one that is done periodically whenever you choose, maybe once a week or once every two weeks. And a net change system is an approach that updates MRP continuously. So it can be done every evening or it can be done right then um, out on the spot. So some of the outputs that come in uh, from MRP processing, we've talked about a lot of these in some of the previous videos, but the planned orders, this is the schedule indicating the amount and the timing of future orders. Okay, that's your planned orders. That's one of the primary reports that comes as an output of processing MRP. Your order releases are authorization for execution of planned orders. Uh, buyers and planners just don't go make and buy whatever they so choose. Uh, they don't uh, wake up one day and decide, hey, what do I want to make or buy today? MRP tells them and gives them authorization to go make or buy an item. And that's what an order release does. It's that authorization from MRP for the execution of a planned order. And then one of the other primary reports from an MRP processing would be changes. These are the revisions of due dates or quantities, uh, or even cancellations of an order. So these are some of the primary reports. Some secondary reports are performance control reports, planning reports, exception reports. These are things that are helping us to look uh, more in the future, um, uh, looking at material requirements that we might need that aren't in the immediate, um, that aren't in the immediate requirement. Uh, an exception report may be a date on any major discrepancy that's encountered, so something that's really far out. Um, how do we go about changing those due dates um, to, to be more in line with our MRP uh, requirement dates? So MRP outputs, there's lots of them, uh, but mostly these reports are the byproduct of the MRP processing, and this is what gives 
buyers and planners authorization to go make or buy orders to support the facility. Okay, MRP and services. Um, uh, up to this point, we've been talking about MRP and we've been using a lot of um, uh, examples from manufacturing, you know, lots of components, screws, nuts, widgets, uh, things that are required to make cars or, or electronic computers and, and things like that. So, uh, but MRP is used in services as well. It's not just used in manufacturing. Uh, the book gives an example of buffalo chicken mac and cheese uh, and it includes in the bill of materials all the garnishes, the sauces, and the core items like the macaroni and the chicken and everything else. Um, those ingredients are all dependent on the sale of that meal or that dish. So MRP is used for catering, it's used in restaurants, because uh, the end item is that finished good product which is either catered food or a meal or a dish or whatever it may be. So all of that is used um, in services as well. MRP is definitely used as long as there are dependent demand items and there's ingredients like a recipe, there then, therefore there is a bill of materials. So all of um, MRP can be used in services as well, whether it's food catering or a hotel renovation. Okay, some of the benefits of MRP. Um, first, it's gonna help us to keep our inventory low uh, and that's because we're only gonna be buying the net requirements that we need not the gross requirements uh, that are needed to fulfill an order. Because again, net requirements is really the core of MRP processing. We want to make or buy what we need uh, and only what we need, not the total amount because we already have on-hand inventory or, or open orders that will help us to support our gross requirements. MRP helps us to build, it helps us to track material requirements. So if we've got an open order for something, we know we can look into MRP and we can say, okay, I've got a hundred units due uh, three weeks from now. Let's, let's go call that supplier and make sure that order is on time. Okay, I can see that I've got another delivery two weeks after that. So that's good. I've got a hundred units coming in in three weeks and I've got a hundred units coming in on the fifth, the fifth week. And it helps us to track those material requirements and uh, make sure that everything is on time to meet our master production schedule. It helps us to evaluate capacity requirements, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Um, and that also helps us to allocate our production time. So MRP is helping us for the requirements, <clears throat> the materials, the material requirements planning. But just because we have the products coming in, the components, doesn't mean we can actually make our finished good item. We have to look at our capacity and our labor workforce and uh, the uptime of our machinery to make sure that whatever material we have coming in, we can actually build to support our master production schedule. And MRP tells us the first step of that, which is look at looking at our material. But after that, we would then look at our capacity and our production time. One of the benefits of MRP is the ability to back flush. Back flushing is used in just in time inventory environments. Um, this is when um, something is completed and brought to finished goods. Back flushing takes the costs of everything in WIP and those raw materials and it assigns it to the work order and it assumes, it rightfully assumes, that if you are shipping a finished good item, that all of the labor that was necessary to support that item and all of the materials that were necessary to support that item have been allocated and used to build that finished good item. So back flushing simply at that time says, okay, we know it was going to take 57 labor hours to build this item. Those 57 labor hours have now been allocated and completed, and they now back flush those 57 hours. Likewise, with MRP and the requirements, if we know we've got something in finished goods and it needs 300 screws or 200 tires or whatever it may be, then rightfully so, back flushing says all of the materials are there, and so therefore they've been allocated and used, those costs are assigned, and then that order is shipped and all of the costs have been um, uh, processed through the system as well. So that's backflushing. So some of the requirements of MRP, obviously you need a computer and the necessary MRP uh, software. Uh, you need accurate and up-to-date master schedules, bills and materials and inventory records, and you need just really good uh, integrity of data. You've got to really have high quality records uh, in order to make MRP run smoothly. Otherwise, there's a whole bunch of MRP system nervousness. You're constantly chasing shortages because inventory that you thought was there is not, or a product that you thought was gonna be delivered on a specific day isn't. So uh, integrity of data is just, I cannot stress the importance of it enough uh, in a well-functioning MRP system. 
Okay, so let's talk about the evolution of MRP. Um, up to this point uh, in chapter 14 for materials requirements planning, we've talked all about the material requirements, and that's the that's the first step of uh, MRP, ERP, CRP, um, all of the different um, uh, evolutions that have gone on since MRP. Briefly, we're going to discuss uh, MRP2, uh, which is material resource planning. Um, it's many times also called CRP, so capacity resource planning. And then we'll also touch upon ERP, enterprise resource planning, and learn what that is. So first we have MRP. This is where we've spent um, the majority of this chapter talking about and all of the requirements that are needed. Next is manufacturing resource planning, MRP2 or capacity resource planning. Uh, this is really um, taking all of the requirements that we have and then looking to see if we can build what we need to build and do we have the available resources. So looking at do we have the right labor? Do we have the right equipment? Uh, do we have people scheduled on time uh, to come and support the orders that we have? So do we have enough capacity to build what we've sold? That is capacity planning. And I'll show an example of a load report, which will help us manage capacity in just a couple slides here. Next is ERP. And ERP, uh, we'll talk about that again in a couple slides here as well. But this is really um, the evolution of MRP and capacity planning. And we take a whole bunch of different modules or business units within the system, and it integrates everything together. So whether it's financial planning or labor allocation or the ability to communicate with our suppliers on when those orders are due, um, it, it helps with forecasting and communication between uh, uh, different divisions and, and sister companies because you might be able to see inventory that's held in a facility um, uh, somewhere around the world. So those are many of the different benefits of an ERP system. And then last but not least is collaborative commerce or C-commerce. This is the optimization of supply chain and distribution channels um, that capitalize on the global economy using uh, collaborative tools. Um, so really an example of this would be like Facebook Marketplace or um, how Patagonia has um, partnered with eBay to help resell uh, some of the uh, Patagonia um, products after they've been used. So collaborative commerce allows people to uh, buy directly from sources that might not necessarily be the manufacturer themselves. And um, it, it's, it's really been great to see uh, collaborative commerce take off uh, because uh, again, this is, it's, it's really used a lot in the uh, reusing of products. So uh, Patagonia with eBay, or uh, REI, the way that they resell their used equipment, that is all through collaborative commerce and, and C-commerce methods. Okay, so capacity planning. Basic MRP does not consider capacity limitations, so capacity planning does. And it's the process of determining the amount of labor and machines uh, and resources required to accomplish the task of production on a more detailed level, taking into account all the component parts and end items in the material plants. So we look at our work centers like milling and painting and baking and drilling, and that's all things that we need to take into consideration in those work centers. Do we have the capacity and the labor and the machine requirements needed to be able to support the orders that we have put into our master production schedule? Load reports are a department or work center report that compare the known and expected future capacity requirements with projected capacity available. So MRP, again, just simply looks at what to make uh, uh, or what to buy, when to make or buy it, and how many to make or buy. It's just a dependent demand mathematical model to help us determine our net requirements. Capacity planning adds a little bit more intelligence to that. So one of the ways that we do capacity planning is we develop a master production schedule. Then we're going to run MRP to simulate uh, the material requirements. How many different components do I need to support my orders? Then we're going to convert those into work orders and purchase orders and see, do we have the resources required to be able to manufacture uh, our master production schedule? If we do, then we're good. We go ahead and we firm up a portion of the master production schedule. We run MRP. We set our, our uh, finished good shipment due dates and everything works uh, smoothly. But if we run MRP, 
and and we look at our master production schedule and unfortunately we cannot support um, the master production schedule because we have a capacity issue then we need to change our master production schedule to support the capacity that we have available to us and then we will be able to su support our master production schedule because we've changed our shipment due dates so maybe we've pushed some orders in maybe we've pushed some orders out but we have to make a master production schedule that matches what we can truly do there's no point in committing to shipping orders on dates that your that your facility cannot support you've got to compare your material requirements planning and your capacity planning to make sure that those orders can be fulfilled on time a customer would rather hear that they're going to have a due date of three weeks and it be accurate than you tell them two weeks and then you're late so capacity planning is a big portion of being able to provide your customers with an accurate uh, committed due date for when their orders can ship so here's an example of a load report uh, when you are in manufacturing and if you're overseeing the manufacturing team or an operations team there is absolutely no point in having your employees twiddling their thumbs in week one and week two working really slow when you know that in weeks three and week four they're going to have to work overtime so what you'll do is when you're in charge of that master production schedule you just take some of the capacity and some of the orders that are due to be built and shipped in week three and week four in this report and you change the schedule to probably put them in week two the reason you do that is now week one they'll still be working 35 hours or so in work center d but in week two they will jump up to most likely 30 to 35 hours as well now your employees won't be working overtime in week three or work four you can choose to ship those orders early if your customers were, will allow them but really what you're just trying to do is manage your capacity because as time goes on you might get more and more orders in week three and week four and so therefore you're already going to be at your max capacity so you really want to make sure that your capacity is level loaded and one of the ways you can do that is by looking at a load report all right so ERP we've talked uh, up to this point all about MRP MRP2 capacity planning now let's pivot here and talk a little bit about an ERP system an ERP system an enterprise resource planning system is the integration of financial manufacturing and human resources on a single computer system it's the next step in an evolution that began with MRP ERP software provides a system uh, and it helps us uh, capture and make data available in real time to all the decision makers in an organization they uh, help us to look at capacity planning labor fi finances and a lot of these different areas that an MRP system does not look at MRP just looks at the material requirements planning ERP systems look at everything one of the things to keep in mind with ERP systems is that they are complicated they are expensive they're hard to maintain and people just do not understand all the ins and outs of the modules MRP is simple MRP is just math it tells us what to buy when to make it and how many okay just what to buy and make when to buy or make it and how many to make or buy ERP systems include everything within that organization so it could be customer relationship management accounting finance supply chain and then there's the MRP portion as well so ERP considers all of that and it's uh, sometimes the, the training can take years the implementations can take years but for many many large organizations ERP systems are necessary because many of the organizations now are very global and so you need the integration with that the, that an ERP system can provide so here is a great uh, visual of the differences between MRP and ERP your ERP modules will include your basic MRP system but it'll also include finance human resources supply chain and customer relationship management so an ERP system is going to include all of these different modules um, that uh, are in the ERP system so an example of what customer relationship management would look like with invoicing or sales order entry or shipping um, in a typical uh, environment where you've got just an MRP system you have to automatically generate an invoice to ship to a customer after they have received your product with an ERP system invoices can be sent automatically same thing for sales orders they place an order and they say I want my order to arrive in five weeks 
with a traditional MRP system, a salesperson or someone in customer service would call and say, yes, your order is on time. Yes, your order is on time. Or no, we've had a delay in that order. Now we've got to push it out a week because some of the materials that we needed are not going to be here on time. With an ERP system, you can do that automatically. So again, you can have that sales order sent to the customer electronically and automated so you don't have to have a person who is notifying customers of either um, improvements or delays to the date that that order is going to ship. So all of these things can be done in an ERP system, but they cannot be done in an MRP system. And that is why ERP systems are so complicated, but useful for large uh, organizations. All right, so some of the disadvantages and advantages of an ERP system. Um, an ERP system helps provide integration between supply chain, production, and administration. It helps create commonality of databases. It helps really improve communication and collaboration between business units and sites um, and may provide a strategic advantage from one company over another because of how it integrates everything within that system. An example of an ERP system um, uh, that I've used um, in, in the past is when I worked for a multi-billion dollar manufacturing facility and we were doing our master scheduling and my team of buyers was looking at materials um, to either make or buy uh, to support our requirements. With an ERP system, they could look at facilities around the world and see if any of them had inventory of an item that we might have had a shortage on. And so instead of going out in the market and buying those products, we could just borrow it from one of our um, other divisions uh, across, uh, across the country or, or somewhere uh, across the globe. And that's something that an ERP system can do. It can help give you that strategic advantage because you can communicate with other organizations or um, internal organizations um, to help create that strategic advantage um, when competing with other companies that might not have that kind of intelligence. Some of the disadvantages of an ERP system are that they're very expensive. Um, people don't understand them. Implementation can take a very long time. And so um, really having people who understand your ERP system are critical uh, for organizational success. But ERP systems um, uh, can be very complicated and hard to manage and maintain. Okay, and then last slide wanted to show, uh, this is not something you will be tested on, uh, but you can see there's a been a really dramatic change to um, how many organizations are using ERP software systems uh, over the course of the last decade or so. Uh, when I started teaching this course in 2013 or so, um, the market for ERP systems was $25 billion. And you can see that SAP had 24% of that market. Oracle had 12%. It's, um, it's 2021 right now. And the market size, um, the last data I could find on the market size for ERP, is that uh, the market size is now $94 billion. And at first that number shocked me. I thought there's no way that it went up by, uh, you know, $70 million in the course of the last six years of companies that have implemented ERP systems. Um, and then if you also look at SAP, how they went from 24% market share to almost 7% market share, and Oracle went from 12% to 4%, um, again, those numbers shocked me, but then it kind of made sense because there are so many organizations now that are doing business internationally that the need for an ERP system is probably critical for their success. There's also the Amazon effect probably as well when looking at this uh, data. Amazon created their own ERP system. They do not use SAP or Oracle. So Amazon, I don't know what percentage increase of market share they helped to contribute from that $25 billion um, number in 2013 up to $94 billion in 2019. But I wonder if their $40 or $50 billion worth of the market uh, for the ERP systems and as a standalone product, if they've made that shift to where that's why you see the others that has shot up to 68%. So you can see there's a lot of ERP systems out there. The, the, the big players are SAP and Oracle. Those are the most commonly used and, and most well-known. Uh, SAP is used in a lot of the um, Forbes, you know, top 10, top 20 organizations that are out there. And, uh, and so it is used a lot in various uh, manufacturing and services settings. So that's our overview to MRP and ERP. And you can see how uh, MRP has evolved over the years to take into consideration MRP2, 
capacity planning, and ERV.